Real Time 1960s presents Evening Report, a complete roundup of today's news with Joe Rubenstein. Good evening. In Washington, President Kennedy speaks out on Cuba. In Mississippi, a federal challenge to state voting laws. In Boston, Edward Kennedy takes a beating. New York's finest dress up, Felix Frankfurter steps down, and the Dodgers hold their breath. Those are the headlines, the details after this message. That's jam by old Virginia, that's the brand to keep in mind. Preserves by old Virginia, they're the finest you can find. Old Virginia, they're fresh from fine and tree. So remember old Virginia, it's the top in quality. You'll just love old Virginia goodies like applesauce, apple butter, tomato juice, apple juice, and the famous old Virginia preserves and jellies. At his press conference today, President Kennedy rejected congressional suggestions that the U.S. invade Cuba. The most recent of these suggestions was made this week by Indiana Senator Homer Capehart, a Republican member of the Foreign Relations Committee. Senator Capehart of Indiana said that the communists are sending troops into Cuba, not technicians, as you told us last week. Capehart also called for a United States invasion of Cuba to stop the flow of uh, troops and supplies. Would you comment, sir? We have no evidence of troops. And uh, I must say that uh, I know that this matter is of great concern to uh, Americans and many others. The United States has obligations all around the world, including uh, West Berlin and other areas, which are very sensitive. And therefore, uh, I think that in considering what appropriate action we should take, we have to consider the totality of our obligations and also uh, the uh, responsibilities which we bear in so many uh, different parts of the world. In response to your specific question, we uh, do not have information that uh, troops have come into Cuba, number one. Number two, uh, the main thrust, of course, is uh, assistance because of the mismanagement of the Cuban economy, which has brought widespread dissatisfaction, economic slowdown, agricultural uh, failures, which have been uh, so typical of the communist regimes in uh, so many parts of the world. So that uh, I think the situation was critical enough that uh, they needed to be bolstered up. However, uh, we are continuing to watch uh, what happens in uh, Cuba with the closest attention. And uh, we'll uh, be glad to announce uh, any new information if it should come uh, immediately. Mr. Answer my question of what I, uh, Capehart's suggestion that we invade Cuba. Yes, I know. I'm uh, I'm not for invading Cuba at this time. (laughs) No, I don't uh, have any, the words uh, do not have some secondary meaning. I think it would be a mistake to invade Cuba. Mr. President, the uh, Soviets, as you well know, are... Because I think it would lead to, uh, that it should be very, uh, an action like that, which can be very casually suggested, could lead to very serious consequences for many people. Later in the conference, Mr. Kennedy was asked about the prospect of Soviet missiles in Cuba. Some of us were told at the State Department the other day that there is Russian military personnel in Cuba. That these are military technicians and other people who are probably going to operate uh, missiles similar to the Nike missile. Cord. Well, I can't. I don't know who told you that at the uh, State Department. They're going to operate Nike missiles because that information we do not have at this time. There certainly are technicians there. There may be uh, military technicians. We don't have uh, complete information about what's going on in Cuba, but in the sense the troops, the word troops are generally used, they've had military advisory mission there for a long period of time. So there may be additional military advisory personnel there or technicians, but in the question of of troops, as as it's generally understood, uh, we do not have evidence that there are Russian troops there. There is an expanded advisory and and technical mission. That's correct. Are there no... uh Anti-aircraft missiles shipped into Cuba? We have no information as yet. That doesn't mean that they haven't been, but all, all I'm saying is we have no such information as yet. Finally, in light of the Soviet buildup in Cuba, the president was asked what the Monroe Doctrine meant to him. Monroe Doctrine means uh, what it has meant uh, since the uh, President Monroe and uh, John Quincy Adams uh, enunciated. And that is that uh, we would uh, oppose a foreign uh, power extending its... Uh, power to, to the uh, Western Hemisphere. And that's why we oppose what is being is happening in uh, Cuba today. That's why we have cut off our trade. That's why we worked uh, in the OAS and uh, in other ways to uh, isolate uh, the communist uh, menace in Cuba. That's why we will continue to uh, give uh, a good deal of our effort and attention to it. 
After the conference, Senator Alexander Wiley of Wisconsin, the ranking Republican on the Foreign Relations Committee, advocated creation of a quote-unquote peace fleet around Cuba to block shipments of communist military supplies. As of this broadcast, the administration has not responded to the senator's suggestion. In Jackson, Mississippi this week, the Justice Department filed a suit asking the federal courts to strike down two sections of the Mississippi Constitution, as well as six state voting laws. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy said the purpose of the laws in question was to, quote, deter, hinder, prevent, delay, and harass Negroes in their efforts to register, unquote. The voting laws in question include the following provisions. Number one. The names of all applicants to vote must be published in the local newspaper before they are registered. Number two, any registered voter may challenge an applicant. The applicant must then undergo a public hearing and a long legal proceeding, the cost of which he must pay if he loses. Number three, if the applicant is rejected, the registrar need not tell him the reason why. Number four, the applicant must complete all forms perfectly with no help from the registrar. Today, both Mississippi Senators, Democrats James Eastland and John Stennis, harshly criticized the Attorney General and his effort to negate these laws. Senator Eastland called the federal suit, quote, a polemic designed purely and simply as a political document to further partisan politics, unquote. President Kennedy announced today the retirement of Felix Frankfurter from active service on the Supreme Court after 23 years as an associate justice. Justice Frankfurter, who was 79, suffered a mild stroke on April 5th. He had hoped to return when the new term opens in October, but he and his doctors decided this would be medically unwise. During his service on the court, the direction of the law has been channeled by many important decisions, which he has rendered. He has always been a vital force in directing those decisions. Few judges have made a significant and lasting impression upon the law. Few persons have made so important a contribution to our legal traditions and literature. The president said he would appoint Secretary of Labor Arthur Goldberg to the vacancy. Secretary Goldberg will bring to the court a wealth of experience gained from the active practice of law for over 30 years. He has had an enviable record of accomplishment at the bar and his character, temperament and ability superbly qualify him for service on the court. His place as an advisor and as head of the Department of Labor will be difficult to fill, but I am confident that he will find an equally wide opportunity for public service in his new position. Informed sources said today that Mr. Goldberg would be easily confirmed. Leaders of both parties expressed satisfaction with Mr. Kennedy's choice. I'll have more news for you after this message. Harvey, want anything special for your birthday? Just a decent cup of coffee. You're kidding. I'm serious. Honey, your coffee's undrinkable pretty harsh. Well, so's your coffee. You know, the girls down at the office make better coffee on their hot plates. And he didn't even kiss me goodbye. You know, if I could just make a decent cup of coffee, I could relax. So, relax. Why don't you try instant Folgers? Tastes good as fresh perked. I'll surprise Harvey for his birthday tonight. Hey, great coffee. It's instant Folgers. Doesn't it taste good as fresh perked? Better. Better than those girls make at the office. Honey, their coffee can't hold a candle to yours. Instant Folgers taste good as fresh perked. Try it. Here again, Joe Rubenstein. At South Boston High School Monday night, Edward Moore Kennedy debated Edward Joseph McCormick Jr. The two men are competing for the Democratic nomination for the U.S. Senate seat once held by President Kennedy. Mr. McCormick, a nephew of Speaker of the House John W. McCormick, called his opponent's candidacy a joke, telling Mr. Kennedy, quote, You never worked for a living. You never held elective office. You are not running on qualifications. You are running on a slogan. He can do more for Massachusetts. This is the most insulting slogan I have ever seen. It says, Vote for this man because he has influence, connections, relatives. I say we need a senator with a conscience, not with connections. We need a senator with experience, not arrogance. And the office of United States Senator should be merited and not inherited. Mr. McCormick then pointed his finger at Mr. Kennedy, who sat just six feet away, and delivered his most devastating attack of the evening. If his name was Edward Moore, with his qualifications, with your qualifications, Teddy, if it was Edward Moore, your candidacy would be a joke. But nobody's laughing. <laughs> nobody's laughing. Nobody's laughing because his name is not Edward Moore. It's Edward Moore Kennedy. I say it makes no difference what your name is. In a democracy, you stand on your own two feet. Clearly stunned by the barrage, Mr. Kennedy, speaking with a shaky voice, tried to keep to the high road. The great problems of this election are the questions of peace and whether Massachusetts will move forward or not. 
We should not have any talk about personalities or families. I feel that we should be talking about the people's destiny in Massachusetts. The two men will debate again in Holyoke one week from today. The state primary is September 18th. Mr. Kennedy is widely viewed as the favorite. Eight of New York's finest volunteered to become eight of New York's fairest last week as the NYPD's Operation Decoy kicked into gear. The startling transformation took place behind the walls of Brooklyn's 4th Precinct Station House, where female officers showed the policemen how to apply makeup and make their walk more attractive to the targets of the operation, potential rapists and muggers. On the job, the masquerading policemen working in the lonelier sections of the city are discreetly trailed by two patrolmen should assistance be required. Operation Decoy, based on a similar program in St. Louis, has met with instant success in New York, resulting in 80 arrests so far, including 38 for felonies. Commissioner Michael J. Murphy said 36 of those arrested had a total of 181 previous arrests. He said the new arrests included 6 for robbery, 4 for felonious assault, 21 for grand larceny, and 11 for narcotics violations. Said one patrolman, quote, The worse these guys look, the more they seem to attract some of these people, unquote. On the South Lawn of the White House today, President Kennedy told 5,000 summer interns who've been working in the executive and legislative branches that he hoped they would return to Washington for careers in government service. This is the most challenging career that could be possibly before any American. And while the compensation may not be as great, the immediate financial compensation, the rewards are unlimited. So I hope that those of you who can uh, will come back here. Those of you who cannot uh, will choose some other way of serving uh, the general interest. The president said that for the next 10 to 20 years, the United States will be responsible for preserving world freedom. And that is a sober responsibility for a country which 20 years ago prided itself on its long isolationist and neutralist tradition. Woodrow Wilson once said that every man sent out from a university should be a man of his nation as well as a man of his time. And uh, I wouldn't want anyone to sit on the sidelines today when so much goes on in the mainstream. So I hope that uh, you come in and join us because the water is not uh, too cold. We're glad to see you. Later, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy spoke to the interns as well. He told the students the nation was headed for disaster unless it moved quickly to end racial discrimination, adding, quote, if we don't make a major breakthrough in this area by 1970, we're going to have a very difficult time proving to the world that we deserve to be a leader and believe in liberty and freedom, unquote. Sports, right after this. He did it again, caused trouble, hurt someone's feelings. Yet he didn't want to do it. Yes, troublesome people are often people in trouble. They may be mentally ill. Find out how you can help. Write Better Mental Health, Box 3000, New York 1, New York. In the Bronx today, the Cleveland Indians swept a doubleheader from the first-place Yankees with a two-run rally in the eighth inning of the opener and a 12-hit attack on rookie right-hander Jim Bowden in the nightcap. The scores were 3-2 and 9-5. Yankee slugger Roger Maris homered in each game, increasing his total to 31 for the season. Maris was robbed of a third homer when his counterpart, right fielder Willie Kirkland, made a leaping catch of his drive to deep right center just in front of the bullpen fence. With this double victory, the Indians clinched their season series with the Yankees just the third time since World War II that Cleveland has accomplished that feat. The sweep further tightened the American League pennant race by cutting the Yankees' lead to just two games over the Minnesota Twins. The Los Angeles Angels trail by three. In National League action, it took 13 innings, but Don Drysdale scored his fifth straight home field victory over the Reds tonight as the Los Angeles Dodgers beat Cincinnati 2-1. The winning hit was a bases-loaded single by catcher Johnny Roseboro. The Reds have never beaten Drysdale in Los Angeles. The six-foot-five right-hander's last home loss to Cincinnati was at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn in June of 1957. Despite tonight's triumph, which puts the first-place Dodgers three and a half games up on the Giants, there is dread in Dodger Town. Sandy Koufax's left index finger refuses to heal. The All-Star Southpaw's finger went numb six weeks ago during a start against the Mets. And though it has shown some improvement, the tip remains tender. As Dodger team Dr. Robert Wood explained yesterday, quote, Sandy broke a blister on the tip of his finger the last time he pitched. When the blood began to flow in the vessels again, it made the finger sore. Now, it is a matter of the finger healing and toughening so he can grip a baseball again, unquote. So, fans in Los Angeles continue to hold their breath, hoping that Koufax can retain his grip, because without it, the Dodgers may lose theirs. 
And that, for this evening, completes our look at the latest news on this Wednesday, August 29th, 1962. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day tomorrow. This has been your Evening Report, a roundup of the latest news with Joe Rubenstein.